What's up, everybody? We're back here with another episode of The Review Crew, IGN's review show, where we bring folks from all over the gaming community to talk about the biggest reviews. This week, we're talking about Sony's PlayStation 5. But wait, didn't that come out like a month ago? Yes, it did. We're talking about one month with Sony's next-gen console. I'm your host, Zach Ryan, and this week, my crew consists of Luke Riley, games editor at IGN, Chelsea Stark, managing editor at Polygon, and Khalif Jenkins, owner and host of the Spawn On Me podcast. I'm going to go ahead and jump right in here, as is tradition, and start with best and worst. Now, when I say tradition, I mean this is something that dates all the way back to last week's episode of the Review Crew, so just so you know where we're at. Uh, Best and worst is a very clever segment where I ask each of my panelists to tell me the best part about owning a PlayStation 5 right now and the worst part about owning a PlayStation 5 right now. So, Khalif, let's start with you. What's your best and worst? Ooh, best part of the PlayStation 5 right now is the controller. It is the DualSense uh, controller for sure. Uh, they have nailed everything they did with the, the rumble. Uh, the sound coming out of that thing is fantastic. It's, it's, it's amazing. Uh, the worst right now is all about storage. Uh, I am running mm-hmm. out of space quickly. Uh, I don't have enough space to put the things on there that I want to play, and I'm constantly having to worry about if my extended storage is going to corrupt my PlayStation. So uh, there's some things to fix on that end for sure. Uh, I really I need to echo Khalif on the storage. I think that's easily the thing about the PlayStation 5 that's the most problematic. Uh, and, and best, I think I have to agree with the controller also, but I guess something more specific that I really, really was impressed with was the global settings for things like difficulty, uh, look inversion, and that kind of stuff. Um, I was surprised that it wasn't part of the setup process. You had to actually just find it later on for such a kind of a useful feature. But that was uh, that was really pleasant to find. It was like the Xbox 360 had that, and then it kind of disappeared from the Microsoft consoles. So yeah, I really like that. Right on. And Chelsea, what about you? What's your best and worst about the PlayStation 5? I the best thing to me is even if I am a PC gamer and I'm used to fiddling with like PCs and installing new graphics card, to me, the best thing is like having accessible ray tracing and having kind of these obvious markers that like this, the console does feel next gen. Uh, Though I agree with the storage. I'm going to say the worst is maybe the controller. Just, Mm -hmm. I think the size is a little too big if you don't have like huge hands. Yeah, we're going to talk we're going to talk at length about storage and the controller and a lot of the other features that we touched on here in best and worst later in the show. But for context, I want to go all the way back to the top and kind of talk a little bit about each of your reviews. If each of you could give me a quick kind of TLDR, you know, if you scored it, what did you score it? What's the over overview of your reviews? Um Chelsea, let's start with your review. I I overall thought, I mean, I really enjoy the PlayStation 5. I think it 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 does make next gen gaming feel a lot more accessible to a lot of people it it is so nice to have short load times like overall we don't we didn't score it but uh i did call it in my headline an excess like a hard-working beefcake which i would say that's pretty true uh you know it is like overall it doesn't immediately you know there's not a groundbreaking game that makes it a must buy right now but it's still a pretty incredible piece of hardware Mm -hmm. I think of all the PlayStation 4, uh, sorry, PlayStation 5 reviews that I read over the course of the last month or so, your headline is definitely my favorite PlayStation 5 review, a hardworking beefcake. I'm considering um, putting a hardworking beefcake on my business card, but um, that's topic for another time. What about you? (laughs) What about you? Tell me about your review. Um, I I mean, I I wrote a a bunch of stuff, or at least in my video review, talked a little about, you know, what this console is trying to do in terms of, you know, make itself, uh, differentiate, differentiate itself from the previous version and in, in, in last gen uh, to now. And I feel like they've do it, they're doing so many good things in terms of, you know, graphical fidelity. Uh, sound is a huge part of the experience now in a way that wasn't necessarily something that they kind of like doubled down on. But, you know, they mm-hmm. talked about Mark Cerny, 3D audio being a thing. And he, I feel like they've actually kind of nailed something special in that space too. And, and the games right now, at least Spider-Man Miles Morales, is the thing uh, that makes you want to buy that console. So, so they're doing a pretty good job out of the gate. I'm New York's only Spider-Man. Please don't screw this up. The city. 
for me, the thing that makes me want to buy this console is Demon Souls, but I did love Spider-Man Miles Morales. Um, Luke, you gave the PlayStation 5 an 8 for great on the IGN scale. You want to tell me a little bit about your review for IGN? Uh, yeah, I think my, my, it's my feelings was that uh, it's a great machine. I really enjoyed it. Uh, it looks ridiculous, um, but there's a lot to like about it. it. It's a good machine. I guess the only thing that sort of gives me pause still at this point, I guess, towards the end of the year when things have, we've kind of had that initial salvo of games and things have quietened down a little bit, is that I'm not find this generation, it's not, it's not limited to PlayStation 5 either, but I'm not finding myself as flawed. Uh, I don't feel like the shift from last generation to this generation has been anywhere near as seismic as the shift from a PS2 to a PS3 or potentially even a PS3 to a PS4. And that, so, yeah, I'm, I'm kind of waiting for that to hit me. Obviously, all of your reviews came out prior to the PlayStation 5's launch. You know, we are fortunate enough to be in an industry where we get to have a little sneak preview and get to do our, our homework early. Um, but now that we're on the other side, um, before we get into the topics here, I really wanted to talk about the launch itself. Um, let's go ahead and start with the launch lineup. Uh, a lot of solid games, I think, on the PlayStation 5. You know, first-party games like Miles Morales and Demon's Souls, third-party support like Assassin's Creed, Valhalla, and Call of Duty uh, uh, Black Ops Cold War, which I almost never remember the full name of, so <laughs> kudos to me for getting through that one. Um, and then, like, indies, too, like Pathless and Bug Snacks. Overall, you know, comparing the PlayStation 5 launch lineup to previous generations of PlayStation, how are we feeling about the lineup in general? Uh, Chelsea, what, what do you think of this launch lineup? I, I I do think it's pretty good. I mean, Miles Morales is outstanding and really fun, but it's also only about a 20-hour experience. So mm -hmm. I, I do feel like there's a little bit more that I wanted from it of just like, what is the one game that I just want to get lost in all over the winter? Yeah, and I, I thought, you know, you had a line in your review um you said the PlayStation 5 is a worthy upgrade to the PlayStation 4, but it might not be essential to grab this holiday season. Launch lineups are often weak, and the obvious blockbusters of P uh, PlayStation 5 games at this point, like Demon's Souls, not exactly uh, you know, super inclusive. Miles Morales takes about 10 hours to beat, and everything else is also on my PlayStation 4. Um, I think that's really interesting context. You know, like this is more so kind of to Luke's point earlier, this generation feels like the first generation in a while that we could potentially hold off for, you know, uh, a few months while we let those libraries build up. Khalif, I, I wanted to talk to you about uh, sort of the launch overall. Um, yeah. You know, outside of the launch lineup, I think that there was a lot of uh, unexpected issues that, that people saw crop up. You know, there's instability, system instability, a lot of crashes happening. Uh, there's the, the notorious download bug where if you had something in your queue, it just simply refused to download for a while. Um, PS5s, you can't find them anywhere because bots took them all so my, my question to you is taking the the launch lineup into consideration versus the actual launch itself how do you feel about the overall launch of the playstation 5 actual launch was a shit show <laughs> <laughs> it was it was nuts i mean it, it was one of those things where I, I i as a person who luckily got seated at a console early felt really bad for a lot of my my other folks who out in the world who just like literally couldn't get anything Mm -hmm. um, and, and be able to kind of share in that experience during that moment. And again, it's like, I, you can't really lay that on the feet of Sony. It's not a thing that they can necessarily do much about. You know, the internet is going to internet whenever it wants to and snatch up all the goodies that it can uh, while it can. But I do think that um, Sony did do a fairly good job, at least of giving people some options that were pretty, pretty nice, actually. I think if you tried to purchase a PS5 directly on their store, they had a queue when it was up and running uh, that was pretty nice to be able to kind of just like sit there, not have to get up at six o'clock in the morning and try to figure out ways to jump onto that queue and and, and possibly get one. And I snagged one of those um, from, from the queue. Every launch is kind of messy. So it's hard to be like, well, in comparison to other launches, I feel like this is kind of pandemic aside, pretty normal, mm. but when you take into account the things like, I don't know, I, I never had any luck with the Q Khalif. So like very happy for you, but I've been trying to help like the remaining uh, Polygon staff get consoles. And it is just a nightmare. Like we've had no, not as much trouble getting Xboxes, but it, it does seem like the hordes have descended and the bots have descended. And it's like very challenging to get consoles. So I definitely feel for people who are like trying to get them for anyone 
in their life. And they're like, damn, I, how are you going to compete with that? If you've got a job and you can't like look at Twitter or Twitch bots all day. That's fair. Uh, Sony's biggest launch in history, according to uh, uh, their reports. Luke, what about you? Closing thoughts yeah. on, on Sony's PlayStation 5 launch? Uh, yeah, I think touching on the fact that it was their biggest launch in history, I think we have to be fair, guess, to Sony that they understand that it's extremely frustrating for, for folks who can't get a hold of one and certainly can't get a hold of one until 2021. But the fact that it is the most successful launch and they have prepared more PlayStations than ever before, I, I feel like... There, there would have been as many as there was possible to make, you know, like, but basically, you know, so I feel like, and again, it's, it's, we're in a very luxurious position. We have PlayStation fives. It's easy for us to say that, ah, oh, well, it's, you know, it's okay to wait till 2021. The launch lineup is, is, is solid, but it's not critical to get a hold of it immediately. You'll be, you'll, you'll survive. You'll be okay. But I, I would stress that I feel like it really, you really can wait. We're going to talk a little bit about the controller. We're going to talk a little bit about the SSD. We're going to talk about our overall impressions. But before that, I think the thing that we we want to talk about probably uh, to start with is obviously the aesthetic. Um, Luke, you said in your review that it is surprisingly ostentatious for something destined to sit beneath the uh, beside black televisions, black sound bars, black subwoofers and a generation of black AV equipment and gaming hardware. It's a bit showy, and in a world of generally sleek and simple techs, it looks a bit, bit out of place, like 2006 version of 2046, which I really love. That made me laugh. Um, but on the other side of the, the spectrum here, we've got Khalif, and you're saying that it's a testament to Sony to say we're going to do something really different inside your home. It changes a lot of the aesthetic around where you want this thing to live. Um, my question to the panel on this segment is, after a month... How are we feeling about the aesthetic? Have we, uh, you know, gotten used to it? Do we like it more? Do we like it less? Uh, Khalif, let's start with you. It's like I have a little mini Barclays Center right underneath my TV. It's kind of great. I, I kind of love it, actually. It's, it's, it's kind of dope. I mean, I, I love the fact that they went wild with it. I mean, you know, whenever we get a chance to see all the fake concept art for stuff way before a console launches, you know, we all have our little favorites of, you know, the boomerang uh, controller that was there for the PS3 and and all those other concept arts that never really make it into fruition. And it feels like somebody in the back of a room was like, let's just go buck wild and do it. I did think I would have mellowed on it a little. Uh, mm -hmm. But in fact, I kind of feel like it's even uglier than ever. Uh, <laughs> and a part, a part of that is because I've kind of shifted it from uh, from one room to another, uh, to, to, the, to the larger TV in my family room for my kids and that kind of stuff. And from that in, in that room, when I look at it, when I come at it, it's from it's the wider angle. It just looks twice as large, <laughs> uh, and that's no that's that, that's 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 impressive considering it's already uh, enormous. Um, I mean, I have to look, what I have to say is like I, I will concede that I'm too old to care really what any console looks like, like as long okay, as it wasn't. That's fair. You know, it's not as long as they didn't shape it like a swastika. It's not going to matter <laughs> what it looks like. Well, I, I'm I, I'm inclined to agree with you. I think that you know. Uh, each time that I look at my PlayStation 5 when I see it, I'm so glad to have it like firmly behind my television in a place where I don't need to see it on a day-to-day -day basis because I also think that it is uh, not the best-looking piece of tech. But Chelsea, I did want to ask you, you know, will you break this tie or, or are you leaning with uh, Luke and I here in, in the camp of uh, this, this machine is ugly? Here's how I think it's ugly, but I also think that history tends to favor bold console design choices sure. and that we're going to probably look back on this and like it. Like, I'm thinking about how nostalgic I am for, like, a cute GameCube design, which was, like, really mocked a lot. But come on, it's iconic to have a console with a stupid handle in the back. One thing that I noticed with everybody's review, not just the three of your reviews, but I think the the vast majority of PlayStation 5 reviews is just the amount of time spent discussing the controller. And yep. I think it's it's sort of goes without saying that the controller, maybe even more so than the the console design itself, is has become more and more of a hot topic to be discussed over the course of uh, the, the month that the PlayStation 5 has been out. Um, Chelsea, in your review, you mentioned that when you first picked up the DualSense, uh, when you first picked up the DualSense, it felt like a perfect controller and it added some heft to the DualShock frame while still sporting a space-age design and it feels next-gen, uh, like when a car gets a curvy, bubbly facelift to make it look more futuristic. But you also talked a little bit about how 
the controller is maybe too big and not necessarily accessible for medium or small sized hands, right? Because like you said, after a certain amount of time, you feel like uh, your hands begin to hurt when you're playing with this controller. Um, over the course of the last month, uh, during your time with the PlayStation 5's DualSense controller, uh, has your opinion changed at all? Do you still feel like you're waiting for a version two of this controller? Are there things about the controller that you dig more so now than you than you did when you wrote your review? I, it, it seemed to me like really dependent on the game of what I was playing because like I went back and played more like finished Miles Morales and I was like, oh yeah, this doesn't bother me in this setup, but in any other setup, I still felt, I still agree with my review that it's like, I've never had any issues with like pain holding a controller. So for me, this was like a weird new thing where I was like, oh, this hurts. And like, I've never had my wrist hurt after playing games for like hour. So yeah, I just, to me, it was like, oh, I'm surprised that this is, it feels like not accessible to everyone. And when I tweeted it out, other people did respond and like, were like, oh yeah, this is my experience as well. So it was kind of nice to, in that moment of like, is it just me? No, it wasn't entirely just me either. So yeah, I think, I, I still think that all of the haptics are amazing. I think like what they've done is like really cool and it, it doesn't feel gimmicky, but it also at the same time, I'm just like still a little bit too big. Yeah, uh, I'm really enjoying my time with the controller. I am sort of in the middle of uh, between, you know, your your thoughts on it. And I think when we talk about, you know, Khalif and, and Luke's thoughts on the controller, uh, they, they like it a little bit more. I'm less inclined to think that it is as revolutionary. Um, I think that it is a very good controller, um, but I'm not like totally blown away with it. Uh, Khalif, in your review, you said the DualSense controller is and can be a revolution of what we think of when it comes to tactical input function in the video game space. You also note that companies need to build DualSense uh, consideration into future uh, uh, games, and you yourself need to, to consider that DualSense uh, uh, support in your future reviews. Uh, how important is it to you to, to have DualSense functionality with every Sony PlayStation 5 game? I think it's the, the the crux of all of of what PlayStation brings to the table that's actually really new and 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 important. Um, I think mm -hmm. that developers are going to have to change the way they talk about language around Rumble when they talk about games that are going to be on the PlayStation Five. I think that's going to be really important because it is it can be super subtle or it can be you know something that 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 is really like uh, you know crucial to to the game experience. And I think you're going to need to be able to people exactly what they should be feeling so they can understand that that one-to-one -one connection is there. The next thing I want to talk about is the SSD. Uh, obviously, I'm inclined to say that the probably the most next-gen thing about next-gen is the load times. Uh, I think that, that the, the speed at which games load no matter how many times I, I load into Demon's Souls or Miles Morales or anything on my Xbox, I'm still impressed with how quickly we get into stuff. Um, but I think everybody sort of pointed out the, the pros and cons of the, the SSD on the PlayStation 5 in, in that, yes, it's fast, but it also comes at the space uh, or at the, at the risk of, of not having enough storage. Um, Chelsea, in your review, you say that uh, considering how big some games are now, especially with 4K textures, it feels like a small SSD. Uh, we look ahead to the next five to seven years of games. Uh, as we look ahead to the next five or seven years of games, it also suggests that we'll be juggling game installations as much as we have been in the last three to four years. Uh, my, my question to you, like you, you talked a lot about the accessibility of uh, 4K ray tracing, right? Like the idea of the PlayStation 5 as sort of a... Uh, Entry level PC to you know like, like rocketing PC gaming. Um, how detrimental is small disk space to the overall PlayStation Five experience uh, when you take into consideration uh, the things that you are getting out of the box, like ray tracing, like 4K, etc. I mean, I think it's going to be detrimental in a, about six months, or even if people who hadn't played through a lot of the PlayStation Plus collection start to download games, right? It's it's going to start to be really obvious when your PlayStation uh, is full. And especially with the weird bugs that we were seeing with download queue issues and everything like that. And also like that nebulous other storage, I do still think that it's like a little frustrating that the, the data storage is so small, even with this accessibility, because like we don't have the ability to upgrade PS5 storage. We can upgrade for four PS4 games. Right. But, it, it seems like such a huge, like, 
because PC gaming still lets you upgrade like much mm-hmm. easier. And like we are capped at this point. Obviously, there's going to be things down the line, but they're not here yet. Alongside just, you know, bigger games and, and, and higher textures and all those kinds of things, that's going to really just hurt so many people who have data caps. Data caps are going to be a huge issue for so many mm-hmm. people uh, where the ability to kind of juggle that stuff, especially if you bought a digital only version of that console is going to be rough for so many people. So Sony's going to have to try to figure out a way to either unlock the cold storage version of that when you have a, an external drive that's connected to it, um, or they're going to have to figure out ways to get all those SSDs that Mark Sony kind of talked about, you know, being, you know, in the market fairly soon after launch into the market fairly soon. Luke, you you talk about, you know, you said in your review that unfortunately one of the PlayStation 5's key strengths, the Lightning Quick SSD, is also one of its weakness, weaknesses, allowing for maybe a dozen games and even fewer. Uh, if they're anything like current-gen behemoths, a month in, do you find yourself already out of space? Is your PlayStation 5 just already chock-full of racing games? <laughs> uh, no, I'm not quite out of space, but I think part of that is because I'm kind of hesitant to start filling it you know i'm, I'm mm-hmm. hesitant yeah i'm same. really i'm being really uh fussy about well what i put on there and and, and what i don't or what, will i download this now or will i not bother um because yeah like it, it caps are certainly one thing but uh just the speed of internet particularly in this country uh, in australia is not that not that fast uh outside of the major major cities um and so all it, it's super impressive if i you know i got i press i press load game I'm instantly on a building in Spider-Man Miles Morales. It's kind of staggering. If you stop and think about it, after after all this time of watching pinwheeling loading screens and and, and just sitting there constantly scratching my, you know scratching myself waiting for this game to load. To have it happen instantly, it's like witchcraft, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, but to lose that time later, to lose other ten hours downloading a game overnight and 20 hours downloading another game overnight. It was like a half solved problem. Um, cause, it went, cause once I, I, I booted it up and I thought, I thought to myself, Oh, I'll go to the, go to the, go to the menus and look what you do. You know, I oh, can move games around, but it's like, but you can't move the games off the console. You know, I kind of looked for a second that you could, you can't move them off like you can on an Xbox, uh, even for storage, which feels like a silly thing considering it's just like, I, we understand you can't play the games, the, the, the new games on, on a regular hard drive. I get that. Uh, but it's peculiar that you can't just store them off console. It's just information, right? I don't know how it all works. Uh, we're, we're running out of time here, so I do want to make some time for the lightning round before we go. Uh, in this round, I'm going to ask rapid-fire questions to my panelists and uh, just off the top of your head, come back with your answers. Uh, you know, like a lightning round. Uh, Luke, I'm starting with you. In uh, one month in, what's the best PlayStation 5 game right now? Astro Bot's Playroom. Okay. Why Astro Bot? Uh, just because I feel like it's the best uh, example of the controller's possibilities. It's certainly the thing that I get people to play when they come around. Uh, Khalif, you play across all kinds of different platforms. If you could only choose between a uh, high-end gaming PC and the PlayStation 5, which do you choose? High-end gaming PC. Easy. Zero hesitation in, in that answer, and I can already hear Sony fanboys uh, coming after both of us. Uh, Chelsea, <laughs> what's your most anticipated PlayStation 5 game, announced or unannounced? Oh, uh, I think I did mention God of War Ragnarok, so probably mm-hmm. that one. Oh, yeah, I'm very excited for that myself. Uh, Luke, you've written nearly every racing game review that IGN has ever done. Uh, if the PS5 was a sports car, what kind of sports car would it be? Mm. Uh... A Pontiac Aztec. Khalif, uh, now that load times are a thing of the past, how will you find time for Twitter.com? Oh, my goodness. I mean, there's always time for Twitter. I, now that I have mm-hmm. fleets, oh, it's on now. Okay. I mean, I can fleet in between times yeah. when things are loading. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Khalif, Khalif is uh, Fleet's number one biggest fan. Uh, you can find him out there on Twitter at Ka Fleet. Um, Chelsea, <laughs> <laughs> Chelsea, what weighs more, a PlayStation 5 or a wiener dog? Oh my god! Uh, a wiener dog with all the fixins, maybe I guess. Okay. Like a child. All right. One. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, Luke, rank the five PlayStation consoles in order of best looking to worst looking. <laughs> PlayStation two, mm-hmm. PlayStation four, PlayStation one, PlayStation three, PlayStation five. Uh, my last question is for you, Khalif. Uh, friend of the show, Paris Lily, said that you're quote a terrible cook. Do you have any response to that? <laughs> 
I mean, LeVar Ball, Montel Jordan, uh, Cedric the Entertainer, they all disagree with him. And, and, mm-hmm. and that's, all, that's all it is. That's all that matters. Fair enough. That, that's some heavy hitters coming out to disagree with, with Paris. Um, <laughs> well, thank you all so much for participating, for joining me today to talk about the PlayStation 5. Uh, before we wrap up here, I do want to give everybody a chance to uh, tell us where we can find you. Uh, you know, let us know what you're working on. Uh, plug something that you really love. If it's a new game that you're playing, if it's something that you're working on. Uh, Chelsea, let's start with you. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at Chelsea Bot, and uh, you should check out Polygon's recently launched merch store. Actually, that's the thing I'm going to plug. Uh, you can occasionally find me on Twitter uh, at Mr. Luke Riley, uh, and beyond that, you can find me at uh, IGN.com. It's a it's a pretty decent website. <laughs> Uh, Khalif, what about you, sir? You can find me on Twitter talking about ribs at Kajakins. Uh, you can find Spawn on Me on all streaming podcast services. Uh, and you can find us doing our show live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash Spawn on Me Wednesday nights at 6.30 p.m. PST. Thanks to my guests, Luke, Khalif, and Chelsea for joining me to talk about Sony's PlayStation 5. And thank you at home for watching. Each week, we're bringing you a fresh cast from around the gaming world to talk about the biggest reviews. But this is a brand new show, and we want to hear your feedback. If you've got suggestions for improvements or recommendations for guests that you'd like to see, drop us a line in the comments below or shoot us an email at reviewcrew at IGN.com. Don't forget, you can catch our full uncut chat in the audio podcast version of the Review Crew on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast services. We'll be back next Monday to talk about the Xbox Series X with IGN's Ryan McCaffrey, Bloomberg's Jason Schreier, and GameSpot's Michael Hine. Until then, stay safe, stay smart, and keep it locked to IGN. 